through research and education, awareness and advocacy, the International Association on the Study of Pain is working to eradicate chronic pain. I want to help people in chronic pain because it's such a burden on their life. It stops them enjoying their life and it stops them interacting with the people around them, in their families, in their communities, in their broader society. I have a lot of people in my family also, like my grandparents who suffered from the chronic pain a lot, and my focus is toward that. I should be in, the, in this profession so that I can contribute as much as I can to relieve the pain. And initially I worked in the operating theatre, and I was particularly interested in what was happening in post-anesthesia care units, and I thought we all have a role to play. And it was at the advent, the initiation of acute pain services, Services. and so I was there right at the very beginning and I'm still there. This is the 2022 World Congress on Pain, the premier global meeting on pain and we are IASP TV, bringing you the latest news and highlights as scientists, clinicians and healthcare providers take over Toronto to fight for a cure. Hello and welcome to day two of IASP TV. I'm Latria Godfrey and I will be bringing you key highlights from our second day here at the World Congress on Pain. From hands-on sessions to sit-down interviews with our keynote speakers and our award winners, IASP TV is the only place to see it all. We will take a visit to UC Davis where physicians and academics are working together to close the pain education gap. And we will hear from this year's Bonica Award winner, Professor Rolf Tree. We are covering a lot of ground, so remember, you can always see our news and highlights from IASP TV anytime on the dedicated page on the IASP website and on our YouTube channel and Twitter feed. And we kick off today with a look ahead at what's to come in the next two years. And to do just that, incoming IASP President Catherine Bushnell joins us here in studio to discuss. Thanks for your time this morning. Thank you. First off, congratulations on being named the next IASP President. What does this role mean to you? Well, I've been involved with ISP for many, many years and you know, from the time that I was a postdoctoral fellow. And so it's this has been it's the most important society for me throughout my scientific life and I've had various roles so being asked to be the president is really one of the most uh, you know humbling experiences of my life because it, this is it means so much to me and I hope that you know I can actually give back a little bit to the society because it's given so much to me over the years. You have held numerous IASP roles throughout the years, as you just mentioned. What has been your greatest achievement to date? For a number of years, I was the, the editor-in-chief of this IASP press, and it, it allowed me to, to invite people to author books and to really try to uh, guide where the, the book press was going. And so I was, it was a very, you know, I, I felt very proud of what we produced at that time. That made me very proud. A key theme this year is trying to bridge the gap between clinicians and physicians and the patients that they serve. Why do you think that that is such a huge obstacle to overcome? Well, interestingly, that was the whole reason that this society was formed in 1973. And the reason that we have these meetings is where we have clinicians come to the meetings, we have basic scientists come to the meetings, and we talk to each other. And that is, I mean, so that's really the raison d'etre for ISP. 50 years ago, we were thinking, about that. But now with issues, the opioid crisis, people are becoming much more aware of the importance of other types of, of pain treatments. Clinicians need to know and patients and scientists need to come together to really share the knowledge to be able to use uh, the, the treatments, the, you know, the, the management uh, uh, modalities that are available. So looking ahead at the next two years, what does an IASP look like under a Bushnell administration? This is our first, you know, face-to-face -face meeting at, at, in four years, and it's wonderful. And people are seeing each other, and they're so happy to talk to each other because so much of what goes on is not 
just listening to a lecture, but it's talking to people in the corridors. It's having these discussions. One of the main things is to be able to bring this back, but there's also great things that can happen because of the new technologies. Turning now to your personal research, you have really focused on the brain's role in pain control and how environmental factors can affect pain processing. For those unfamiliar, what have your findings uncovered? So I've been interested in how emotional states can alter pain, they can increase pain or decrease pain, how the attentional focus alters pain. Uh, we all know from, you know, from if you have children or something that uh, uh, they, they fall down, they scrape their knee, they're crying, and if you can get them distra distracted, particularly with something good that puts them in a good mood so that you, you put them in a good mood and you distract them, you give them an ice cream cone, suddenly they've <laughs> completely forgotten about this, you know. I was going to say, it's amazing how lollipops can treat pain. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and lollipops treat pain because they both alter the emotional state, it, it makes the person feel good, and it distracts them. And, and so some of the things we've done is looked at the whole brain circuitry of how this works because it's a real physiological phenomenon. It's not just that the person is ignoring the pain, it actually, that lollipop actually engages circuits that dampen the input into the brain. So it's not just, you know, that it's there and you're ignoring it. No, it actually reduces the pain. Catherine, thanks so much for your time today. Best of luck these next two years. Thank you so much. The pain education gap is a significant driver of the opioid crisis in the United States and around the world. But that gap is finally starting to close, all thanks to UC Davis's Center for Advancing Pain Relief. Let's check it out. Pain is so common, you know, it's one of the first things you learn about in life. And it's very complex in that it's truly a mind-body phenomenon. And yet, we are inadequate in the education that we give all health professionals, not just physicians. The pain education gap exists because pain is part of every clinical discipline, but it's not the primary part of any, so it becomes an orphan. And we need to change that. It is possible for clinicians, even though it doesn't have a molecular weight, it doesn't have a um, MRI footprint, it is very possible to understand pain well enough to be able to effectively treat it. UC Davis has really been sort of a leader um, in looking at this education component. And so we wanted to train pretty much all of the primary care providers in the state of California and beyond. At UC Davis, the competencies for pain management were designed and fostered here. These are the actual fundamental principles of what's required to teach about pain in, at medical school curricula. We use that at that stage. That will take several years to build that curricula, but we're already seeing the fruits of teaching people early. Now we're left with the workforce that never received that education. The first pathway that we we had for reaching them was something called Project ECHO, which is a well-known system of telementoring, where we reach out to clinicians who can't get pain specialists to see their patients and help teach them how to do it. P3 evolved out of that to become a way to train, a, train the trainer, which is the Primary Care Pain Management Fellowship, was to train at least one or two people from a health system a little bit higher up than maybe um, on the floor all the time that would say, I want us to know this in our health center. I want to go and learn. I will come back and teach my peers. And then we will also look at how we can change some of our systems, procedures and protocols in order to influence the way we're doing pain management with our population. And it does so with a couple critical educational strategies. Those are working with a mentor directly actually having abilities to phone a friend. When I have a difficulty, I can talk to someone that has experience. Three, the actual didactic type of education, which is actually preformed material, videotaped material, and other materials provided to the learner. And then actual dynamic learning sessions done by teleeducation. I really wanted to take this uh, fellowship because I really want to have all the tools that I could possibly have so I can present those to my patients and I can feel like I'm being the best provider I possibly can be. Everybody has heard of individuals having back pain, for example. Well, is it, you know, 
I said, you know, arthropathy, or is there any radiculopathy? And, and if so, why? And, you know, uh, and being a little bit better in regards to like, you know, a, a clearer diagnosis and therefore a better treatment plan. I think as a T3 fellow, I think I am a more effective provider, um, but then also a more effective teacher. I wanna be that person who cautiously um, and with full knowledge treats people for their pain as well as support them in other areas of their lives and in their health. Pain management and how we've managed pain over the years has, with the opioid crisis, become a public health crisis. The only way we can do this is to help providers help their patients who help their families and who help their community. It's really a force multiplier to educate as many people as possible, high yield information, and, uh, and to do it at a short period of time of complex material. It's an impactful project, but it needs to scale much larger to have the impact that it can have um, regionally and nationally. For me, I have pride in the fact that this program could help millions of clinicians release them from the reliance they might have on opioids and, and allow them to only use opioids when the benefits outweigh the risks. Um, and this is an avenue that it's actually been hard to get um, partnership on because it's so compelling to just address the opioid as opposed to that fundamental problem. So um, I'm proud that we at UC Davis have been able to lead the way, but it's not without having partners all over the United States and all over the world, and particularly partners like the IASP. The John J. Bonica Prize for Distinguished Lifetime Achievement in the Basic Science of Pain is presented every two years to an individual who has made a major contribution to pain research or therapy. This year, Professor Rolf Trade is the deserving recipient and he joins us now in studio to discuss. First off, congratulations on your prize and your award this morning. So how does it feel to be awarded by your peers in such a way? Well. <clears throat> On one hand, it's the honor for myself, but of course it honors a broad range of work that I didn't do alone, but there are many people involved in several institutions that I worked at, but also that I collaborated with. Wonderful. Well, let's discuss your research a little bit more that was recognized today. Tell me a little bit more about it. Well, I think uh, the two topics that were covered, so one is uh, sensitization so that the pain system becomes more sensitive to process signals. The other part was for the clinical implications and uh, those culminated in a classification of all chronic pain types that we developed for ISP and were able to convince the World Health Organization to include into their system. And you know, this award is given to someone whose work is not only demonstrating an expertise in their field, which there certainly does, but also someone who has an interest and insight and perspectives from other disciplines as well. So someone who's looking for collaboration. How uh, important is it to you to work in a collaborative way? Oh, absolutely. So this is something I really love about ISP. It's, it's, <clears throat> it's uh, interdisciplinary in nature. So, it started out with lots of anesthesiologists, psychologists, drones, basic scientists were around from the very beginning, uh, physiotherapists, neurologists, and what, what have not. And this is quite unique and it doesn't work in, in other fields of medicine. This is, I think, very important to make progress in research. If you want to explain phenomena in real life, uh, you need to talk to the people who treat patients and also with respect to, to changing things. So, so the vision of ISP is to, to actually basically improve pain management. Do you think that your research would be as successful as it is today were it not for that collaboration with others? Well, central sensitization as a topic, um, I was first uh, exposed to when I worked at Johns Hopkins at the neurosurgery department that was basically an interdisciplinary pain clinic together with anesthesia and psychiatry. Then when I went back to Germany, we continued uh, with anesthesiology and neurology and uh, a lot of the work was interdisciplinary. In my lab uh, I have biologists, I have uh, biotechnicians, I have psychologists, and this is pharmacists. Uh, uh, this is quite important to really look at all the facets. What are you most hopeful for with regard to the future of your work? Well, again, with the, the two parts, central sensitization and the classification. For central sensitization, I hope that people 
took to the heart the proposed division into three very different phenomena, whether it's spinal cord, brain stem, or brain, that I think can be distinguished tentatively clinically. And I hope that in the future, people will not just talk about central sensitization, but be more specific which subtype they want to talk about. And then from both the basic science and the clinical side, I think with more precision in the reporting, uh, this should advance our understanding. And hopefully we can then modulate these three subtypes of central sensitization. The, the hope for the classification is that it will, in the not too distant future, translate into healthcare systems, mm -hmm. also paying for the good things that people can do. Uh, what we have been able to introduce into the, the global system is a classification. And now the member states of the World Health Organization have to do something with it. Well, once again, Professor Triedig, congratulations on your award today. Such a huge accomplishment, very well deserved. Thanks for your time today. Pleasure to be here. Identifying and nurturing the next generation of pain professionals is a key component of IASP. And joining us now is one rising star here in the Early Career Lounge, Dr. Kirstie Bannister. Well, Dr. Bannister, first off, congratulations on your award this year, the Patrick D. Wall Young Investigator Prize for Basic Science. How does it feel to be recognized as an outstanding scholar by your peers? It feels incredible. I still haven't quite processed that I'm going to be receiving the award. Um, I think it won't feel real until it, it happens. Um, it's especially poignant because Patrick D. Wall was the mentor of Professor Stephen McMahon, who um, died last year and was one of my mentors. So, and he actually instigated my nomination for the award. So it feels, um, I feels incredible and emotional and yeah, I, I feel it's incredibly privileged. So talk us through what a day in the life is really like for someone that is working to bridge bench to bedside. Actually, probably really boring compared to what you think it might be. Um, there's a lot of writing, there's a lot of admin, paper publications, grant inputs, and really it's my team on the ground that are running around doing all the really cool stuff and all the really innovative science. And occasionally they let me go in the lab and I ask them what they're doing and you know we discuss data and results. But largely, um, it's also about communicating with uh, not only preclinical researchers, but also clinicians. What's great about doing this kind of work is that no two days are the same. I definitely feel that the knowledge we're generating is getting out there. Um, I feel confident of that, especially because of a lot of the interdisciplinary conferences and meetings that we attend. There's obviously a much longer time course between thinking of a test you can do at the bedside based on a translational mechanism. Um, so, you know, that's a, that's a, a long game. Uh, but the short game in terms of communicating our aims and our outcomes um, with the clinical audience, I feel is, is definitely something that we achieve quite regularly. How much support would you say is truly needed from the previous and prior generations for scholars like you to accomplish the work that you want to accomplish? Oh, it's huge. People like Mac and Tony Dickinson, Alan Basbaum, Karen Davis, Irene Tracy, all these um, incredible people who, um, from the first day that I became a postdoctoral researcher investigating pain mechanisms, have offered me advice, they've given me their time, um, looked over applications, given me feedback, and just been wonderfully supportive. And so my hope and what I do now is feed that forward. Dr. Bannister, once again, thank you so much for your time today and congratulations on your award. Well, that wraps up day two of IASP TV from the Metro Toronto Convention Center. Remember, if you missed any of today's exciting and informative highlights, just check us out on the dedicated IASP TV page on the IASP website, or you can always find us on our YouTube channel or Twitter feed. Plenty of ways for you to watch. We'll be right back here tomorrow with more engaging and insightful news, highlights, and interviews as the 2022 World Congress on Pain continues. Have a great day.